Hi guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we've got a 4th of July special video <clears throat> which was requested by one of my subscribers and I thought it was a fantastic idea. Talk about some fragrances uh, that either remind you of America or independence or, you know, independence of um, yourself, your soul, your brain, your mind, your country, whatever it may be. So what I did is I picked the American designers. I thought it would be cool to go through some of the um, houses, the fragrances in my uh, in my portfolio, uh, in my collection that are from American designers. And then I picked a couple fragrances that, <clears throat> you know, the stories that they tell remind me of um, America, remind me of, you know, either points in America's history or uh, independence in one way or another. So let's start, but before we do, I want to show you a couple things just so you know, I'm big on, I've told you before, I'm big on, you know, reading and Stephen King books and stuff like that. But what you guys don't know is I'm also big on, uh, biographies and I've done a lot of these, uh, bio I've read a lot of these biography books about the founding fathers. This one's on George Washington. They used to call him, uh, his Excellency, because they didn't know what to call him. He was the first president. You know, they they uh, couldn't call him uh, what they called kings and queens overseas, right? And the other thing about Fourth of July and America's independence is the founding fathers, even though they all fought on the same side, after the independence was won from Britain, uh, they began to kind of quarrel and disagree on what were the reasons behind the revolution. Some people thought it was because of religious persecution. Some of the founding fathers thought it was more monetary, um, you know, the taxes imposed by the king, that kind of thing. Um, some people thought it was just plain disrespect, forcing British soldiers to be able to live in the homes of, col you know, colonies, uh, of the people who lived in the colonies, you know, forcing them to take in British soldiers into their homes, uh, kind of violated their rights, that kind of thing, you know, um, and just blatant disregard for the thoughts and feelings of the colonies themselves. Another obviously important founding father was Thomas Jefferson, um, who ultimately became one of our early presidents, and, um, you know, he had his own thoughts on on the reasons behind the revolution. And then even some of the people um, who did not, be, who were not ever president, like Ben Franklin, for example, played a huge role in the American Revolution. Um, he's obviously on our $100 bill right now, but uh, he played a massive role in actually securing funding. That's what this book's about. It's called A Great Improvisation. They sent Ben Franklin over to France to try to procure funds for the revolution. How can you fight a war against one of the greatest world powers without money, right? And he was able to go to Versailles and speak with the, you know, um, speak with um, the uh, French monarch and procure funding at a time where France in their own country was going through sort of this revolution you know, the coffers of the um, French bank, the um, the uh, crown, if you will, back then. They didn't have central banks like we do today. But the coffers of the royal crown, um, you know, they were feeding money to America at a time where they were about to have their own revolution in France. <clears throat> so if it wasn't for that money, and, you know, part of it was done, I think, because... Um, you know, they wanted to hurt England. Obviously, France and England were um, sworn enemies at that point. But also, um, you know, I think they wanted to see kind of like this wave of freedom wash across the world. They thought if, if America can do it, then it could happen anywhere, right? And uh, they really believed in the American experiment. Um, and then, of course, my favorite of these books, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, this is probably the best one I've ever read on... Alexander Hamilton, who also was never president, but what an amazing story. I don't think you could write a better, you know, captivating story if you tried than this guy's life. Born poor, you know, born a bastard, basically, 
he was very sensitive about that. In fact, it ended up getting him killed uh, at the end of his life because he challenged Aaron Burr to a duel, who was vice president at the time, for, you know, questioning or challenging his uh, pride. And uh, he ended up dying because of it, ultimately. But what a brilliant man. Even though I don't agree with what he stood for, um, for, you know, with him, he actually penned the um, very first Bank of the United States, uh, their charter by hand. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable mind he had. Um, and he did get into some problems. He ended up getting blackmailed by a woman and he ended up paying huge sums of money to them because of that. Um, but think about this. This is a guy that was so trusted by George Washington that Washington actually allowed him to write his, his speeches. And Washington would get up there and he would read the speech without ever looking it over. That's how much he trusted Alexander Hamilton. He was a colonel, um, a general. I'm sorry, he was a general in the American Constitutional Army. And uh, they were, he was basically referred to as General Hamilton for most of the rest of his life. Even when he became, um, uh, you know, Treasury Secretary or whatever they called it back then. Um, he was big on the financing side of things, ultimately. But um, what a story. Fascinating. If you've never read Hamilton, they ended up making the play. This book inspired... Uh, the guy that did the Hamilton Broadway play so much, they made a play out of it. And I've never seen the play, but I can tell you the book is absolutely fantastic. It is thick, so you've got to you've got to have some time. But um, just from a pure story perspective, amazing story. Um, all right, enough of that. I know you guys aren't here for a history lesson. Plus, I read some of those 10, 20 years ago, so they're not fresh in my brain. Um, but let's do fragrances. So I pulled some of the designers that have either a founding in America, they're American founders, or, you know, even if they were born overseas, they um, had an American story where they immigrated here and started their company here, that kind of thing. The first one I'm going to show you is Bijan Man. Now, this is a vintage, uh, and I actually did a comparison video. If you go to my channel, uh, you can go to the playlist, go to comparison, or you can just type in Bijan Man, it'll come up. This is the original Bijan Fragrances ink. Someone mentioned that there's a version even before this that was a cologne, which I don't have, but this is still a vintage compared to the new stuff. This is an eau de toilette, but the original vintage, someone told me, was an eau de cologne. And Bijan was basically founded by a man uh, named Bijan... Paxad. And Mr. Paxad was born in Tehran in 1940 to a very wealthy family. They provided him with a first class education in places like Switzerland and Italy, stuff like that. And he began creating pieces, menswear pieces to sell at his boutique in Tehran. So he ended up moving to Los Angeles in 73 and he realized there was this need for a menswear collection. So he opened his first American boutique in 76 and it was on one of the busiest streets in LA. He had a lot of money, obviously. And then he opened up more stores in places like New York. If you look on the bottle, it says, you know, New York, LA, all the different places they have, um, they have boutiques. And so he did all kinds of stuff, purses, fragrances, ca uh, caps, shoes, clothing. Uh, and they had a very niche clientele, celebrities, royalties, presidents, stuff like that, international artists. And um, um, this fragrance ended up coming out <clears throat> in 1981. And then I think it was re-released. Now, the bottle is somewhat of a um, contentious point. Some people say this looks like a golf ball. Some people say this looks like maybe a turban on someone's head. You know, there's and he is from Iran. So there's all kind of thoughts on the bottle. Either way, it's a fantastic bottle. There's a hole in it, obviously. Um, but the fragrance itself is fantastic. If you can get a vintage, I would encourage you to do so. But even the new stuff is very, very good. Um, it's a little bit of a different fragrance. If you watch my comparison video, you'll notice that. But the sandalwood and the patchouli and the musk and the amber just blends with the citrus in the opening. It's so masculine. This was Arnold Schwarzenegger's signature scent is the rumor. 
and it would fit him perfectly. Okay, next we're going to talk about Tom Ford. And I'm not going in order. Some of these are older, some of these are newer. So we're jumping straight to Tom Ford, uh, who was in the fashion world for years and years and years. Um, but he really started to come into contact with fragrances in the early 90s. And in 92, he became creative director at Gucci uh, and had the say over basically their perfume division. Then in 2000, he famously took over the creative director spot at YSL and was responsible for pioneering the first Oud fragrance in M7. The Oud theme continued with him as well, as I'll show you in just a second. Um, but what Yves Saint Laurent, the man, and Tom Ford butted heads. Yves Saint Laurent didn't like the, the direction that Tom Ford was taking his house because he wasn't in control anymore. You know, Tom Ford had control, but he still didn't like it, and he had some influence, and so they butted heads, and ultimately Tom Ford made the um, famous decision to leave YSL in 2005, and he partnered with uh, Estee Lauder, and um, they basically put out his line in 2006, I think it was introduced, 2007 is when the famous Private Blends came out, um, and the rest was history. I mean, it's one of the pricing model of Tom Ford was revolutionary at the time because even the original, like this is the original Tom Ford for men from 2007, I believe, uh, which is discontinued now, unfortunately. Um, but yes, it is. It's discontinued. 2007. This is a 2008 bottle, by the way. So this is right smack at the beginning. And even this one is not super heavy. It's meant to be this light, spi woody, spicy scent, but there's a lot going on here. There's even a note of Cipriol, which usually you find Cipriol in really heavy fragrances. So for them to be able to make this tobacco, citrusy, um, you know, patchouli, vetiver, there's a leatherwood note. There's a lot of very interesting notes in here. Tunisian, orange blossom, absolute, stuff like that. And then Cipriol, oak moss, um, you know, what he did with his pricing model was brilliant. He priced it above just a normal designer. So if you were buying this fragrance um, at the time when it was released in 2007, 2008, you were buying something that was seen as a premium product to even just a normal designer. So even his cheapest line was seen as premium. And then when the private blends came out, they were really set at aspirational prices. Now, the prices have continued to go up over time, of course. But, um, you know, from the get-go, they set the brand up in a way that it was seen as luxury. It was seen as something to strive for, for the average person to own a, a Tom Ford. And this little bad boy came out in the same year, 2007. And you can see this is one of my most dented bottles. Um, it's almost gone. Uh, and the reason is, is that this is my wife's favorite fragrance on me, surprisingly. Um, Oud Wood by Tom Ford has this very synthetic Oud feel, especially after smelling Bortnikoff's and Arige Ladori fragrances from Russian Atom, which by the way, shameless plug, if you haven't watched my Russian Atom interview, it's almost two hours of absolute gloriousness. I've watched it multiple times myself just to listen to him talk without interviewing him, just get to sit back and listen to him talk. What a, what, I mean, what a creator that guy is. He truly loves the art of creation and being an artist. And, and that's a lost, you know, it's a lost art nowadays. They're making stuff like this for money. Uh, there's very few people who are still in it for the love of fragrance and art. And I think Russian Adam is one of those people. So check that out if you haven't. But Oud Wood has this, it's basically, it should be called cardamom wood, in my opinion, because this is a huge cardamom fragrance. One of the best cardamom fragrances, I think. Uh, but you get that synthetic oud note, you know, he did M7 in 2002 with YSL, and then he continued that style with oud wood. Um, this isn't as ambery as uh, M7, doesn't have that cola vibe, but it's, it for, for the time it was released, it was very unique. And this is actually, according to a Tom Ford rep that I spoke with, this is their best selling fragrance at this moment, period. Uh, out of everything, I think. This is the best-selling. Or maybe she said for men. I can't remember. 
but it's top of the list either all 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 of their fragrances or on just the men's side um so that's oud wood and then of course one of my favorites and probably my favorite is i wish i had a bigger bottle is tuscan leather again revolutionary at its time um harry fremont and jacques cavalier created this and this is this raspberry saffron leather with suede in the base frankincense thyme jasmine copied many a times like by you know fragrances like um you know like yucca Wam by rasasi they did a fantastic job copying tuscan leather but still this is the original this is the one that uh deserves the credit and you know for what it did some say it has a cocaine smell to it um which I've never done, I can't speak to that, um, but it, it does have this dirty ashtray, this dirty ashtray cigarette pool hall vibe is what I get. Dirty leather jacket, man, you know, man smoking a cigarette, playing pool with his buddies, drinking beer, it's smoky, there's stale butts in the uh, ashtray because the people at the pool hall don't care enough to even empty them out, that kind of thing, you know? It has that bad boy, dirty couch vibe. You know, dirty leather couch, you're sitting there waiting to shoot pool, waiting for your buddy to, to shoot, that kind of thing. Uh, and then in 2015, they released Noir Extreme, which there was a women's version as well, which is just as good, honestly. If you can get the women's version of uh, Noir for cheaper, I would say just do it. But this is a 10 ml decant of uh, Noir Extreme which the writing is very small on the bottom. I doubt you'll be able to see it. Um, but either way, it's a sweet gourmand fragrance. It has this, um, it has this kulfi um, note, which I think is like an Indian ice cream type feel um, with nutmeg, cardamom, saffron, sandalwood, rose, orange blossom, jasmine, and vanilla. You know, you have to like sweet fragrances, which I really don't, but when I get the urge to wear something sweet, I could wear something like this, or I could wear Burberry's London, you know, for example, with that sweet port wine, something like that. Um, great cold weather fragrance, both of those I just mentioned. And then probably the one that is discontinued that should get more love uh, from vintage enthusiasts like myself is this. This is Tom Ford's Noir Anthracite. And it only came out in 2017. It got discontinued like two years later. I mean, it was there and gone. And um, it's got this Sichuan pepper ginger opening. There is even a tuberose note in here, but don't think, you know, uh, carnal flower or anything like that. There's this green galbanum note mixed in with jasmine sambac, which throws people off. And then you get patchouli, macassar woods, cedar wood, and uh, Ceylonese sandalwood. And it's, it's you know, the, the bottle here, you can see the bottle similarities between the two that it gets compared to. This is Narciso Rodriguez for Men EDT. Also discontinued, sadly. Both of these are discontinued. Um, but I love them both. I'm glad to have them both. And uh, this is the final Tom Ford on the list. Okay, we got to get a move on because we are way behind schedule and I got a lot of fragrances to cover. So next, we're going to do a Pharrell Williams. Now, Pharrell Williams is a uh, American rapper or songwriter or producer or whatever you want to call it. But he actually had a celebrity fragrance called Girl. Now, this was done by Comme des Garçons. But you can see Pharrell Williams' name right here on the front. This is also sadly discontinued. Pharrell Williams had a love of Fahrenheit. And so what they did is they took that Fahrenheit violet note, gasoline opening, and they added a couple things like lavender and neroli. So you get that Fahrenheit vibe, but then it goes in a different direction. And it dries down with sandalwood, vetiver, cedar, and patchouli. Beautiful fragrance, um, completely unisex, but I think it even leans masculine, but I absolutely love uh, Pharrell Williams' Girl. Then we're going to talk about Carolina Herrera, who is a Venezuelan designer, 
she actually immigrated to the United States and um, opened up her boutique in New York, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and she ended up getting her citizenship only, I think, five or six years ago. She only became a U.S. citizen five or six years ago. But what better American story than an immigrant from Venezuela comes to America, founds her brand, uh, and, you know, she really founded it in New York. So um, this is one that is a vintage bottle I got from Anuj, and it's called Herrera for Men. Herrera for Men came out in 91, Rosendu Matu and Carlos Benaim, two all-stars, created this. And this is a fresh uh, take. It's the 90s, so you're going to get freshness, you're going to get the Neroli and stuff like that, geranium. Um, but there is a lavender note. There's also a tobacco in the base, but it's a fresh tobacco, kind of like Dolce & Gabbana. Uh, Pour Homme has that fresh tobacco. This one does the same thing. I think I prefer the Dolce & Gabbana, but I'm going to wear this more. I've only worn this to bed once. I've never given it a full wear, so I will wear it more and talk more about it later on. And then in 2009, there was a fragrance called CH for Men. Now, this is the old presentation with the little dup 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 here. It's now, I think, stapled down on the bottom right of the bottle. Um, but it's a sweet, leathery scent. Normally, I don't like sweet. But, and this is like sugar sweet. So this is like a guilty pleasure for me because it has this green grass and violet opening. It's very strange, actually. And then you're instantly hit with this synthetic saffron, like saffroline-like smell with nutmeg and this sugar, almost like they just dropped a sugar cube in here. Um, and this is a partial I ended up getting from Anuj. But uh, the base is this very interesting suede. So you can see the leather uh, on the front, which is kind of, of I like the uh, design. I like this. like it a lot, actually. I think it's very classy. Um, but inside, you don't get the leather. You get this massive suede with cashmere. There's a huge dose of what smells like some sort of synthetic, you know, cashmeran, isoe super. But... Um, you know, if you like designer leathers, don't overlook this one. No one talks about it anymore because it came out in 2009, but it's definitely worth mentioning. And then the one that does still get hype, especially in the winter sometimes, and I think it's a fantastic designer release, is this. This is CH Men Privé. And um, I don't know about formulations. My batch code is 60471, but um, this is a sweet, spicy... Uh, whiskey scent. So it's whiskey and leather in the base. Uh, and there is some uh, lavender, grapefruit, cardamom, but it's really about that whiskey note. In the summer, I mean in the summer, don't wear this in the summer. In the winter, this is absolutely fantastic. The bottle is shaped like a flask. Um, I love the presentation. I love the, uh, I even really like the fragrance probably my favorite Carolina Herrera fragrance. Uh, I think this is a great release. I think it's a brave release, and I think they did a great job. For a designer uh, liquor scent, liqueur scent, for a whiskey designer, they did a, they did a bang up job. All right, we're going to jump back in time. We're going to get in our time machines and go back to 1975 from the house of Jeffrey Bean. This is gray flannel. Now, um, Jeffrey Bean, uh, is a American designer that doesn't get much talk anymore. You know, not many people talk about Jeffrey Bean, and, the, and it's because the two fragrances I'm talking about that I have in my collection came out long time ago. This is 1975. Uh, I have an older bottle than this as well, but, uh, they're, they're both equally nice. This is not a new, new bottle, by the way. That's what the bottom of this one looks like. But the opening of the vintage that I have is out of this world. The first 30 minutes is unbelievable. Um, and gray flannel, um, gray flannel has this beautiful green galbanum opening with narrowly and citruses. There's florals in here. There's iris, mimosa, violet, rose, geranium, narcissus, and then sage. And then the base is oak moss, almond, tonka, vetiver, and cedar. Uh, and it's funny because I listen to these young kids on YouTube 
you know, basically talk down about this fragrance. They spray it and they're like, oh, it's so bad. This is a fantastic composition. If, you know, maybe not the newest stuff that's put out by EA, but if you can find some of the older stuff, I would highly encourage you, or, or even, I think it might even be discontinued now. I think it was marketed by French Fragrances Inc. back in the day, and then they just completely discontinued it, which is a shame. Another one that's discontinued is this. This is Jeffrey Bean's Bowling Green. Now, be careful because the Eau de Toilette is not, discon is not discontinued. I think you can still buy the Eau de Toilette. The Cologne is. So this is the Cologne Spray. And the cologne is discontinued. And so, oh, this is so good. This is fantastic. This is actually my favorite Jeffrey Bean, I think. It's um, green. It's really like, it's really like a ultra green fougere. There's uh, basil, bergamot, juniper, lemon, with green Artemisia, that 80s green Artemisia they used to put in masculine fragrances back in the day. Cardamom, cinnamon, beautiful pine, fantastic pine, uh, fantastic oak moss, balsam fir, and then you get a little bit of woods in the base, cedar, sandalwood, amber. It's so classy. It's so, I mean, you know, the... Um, if you ever go look at some of the pictures of that Ralph Lauren did for some of his advertisements where they went and took pictures with, uh, you know, up, upper class families in New York, in the Hamptons, you know, playing tennis on the weekends. Ralph Lauren did pictures uh, like that for some of his advertisements and some of his booklets. That's what Bowling Green reminds me of. It reminds me of country clubs, golf, tennis you know, warm days in the upper northwest of the United States, but not so warm where, um, you know, you can't go outside and enjoy yourself. Like, it's going to be 100 degrees today. We're doing fireworks here in Texas today. You can't go outside for 10 hours. You got to, you know, limit the amount of time you're outside. In New York, when it's 80 in the summer, you can go outside, spend time in the sun, and you're not feeling like you're roasting, you know. And, I, and my grandmother and my, and my mother are actually from upstate New York. So I spent a lot of summers when I was young there, and um, that's what this reminds me of. You know, she had, my grandmother had raspberry plants in the backyard. She had a beautiful pine tree in, in the front. You know, it, it just reminds me of, it, rem, it reminds me of that vibe, that green, you know, upstate New York vibe. Beautiful fragrance. Um... High class is what it reminds me of. It reminds me of the upper crust, you know, playing tennis, um, playing polo, that kind of thing. That reminds me more of playing polo than some of the polo fragrances. Okay, next we're going to go to the house of Halston, who is also an American designer. Um, Roy Halston Frowick, born in 32 in Iowa. He opened his uh, first fashion store in Chicago at the age of 25. And the name Halston just basically stuck. So it became, um, he really burst onto the scene in 61. He created lots of hats. Uh, the legendary pillbox, which uh, Jacqueline Kennedy wore to her husband's inauguration, was a Halston creation. And um, it really spilled over in Europe, in Germany in particular, um, you know, with the releases of the Halston Z14 and Halston 112, which were actually their working names, okay? So that was like the code name that the company gave them. And um, these are the two that are, are most synonymous with Halston when you talk about their, you know, fragrances. Um, the shape of the flacon, Everything that they did was very, you know, they had this cult-like following. And um, there's an amazing documentary on Halston the Man, by the way, on Roy Halston Frowick. If you haven't watched it, I think you can find it on YouTube. I would highly recommend it. He um, had this trend, you know, who... Um, he had this... He set this trend, basically, going to Studio 51 in New York... Uh, this is what, and if, and if you, and if you liked my interviews, I interviewed one of my good friends, Al Manzano, who 
isn't in the fragrance community, isn't in the fragrance world as far as uh, he's not a perfumer, he's not a brand owner or anything like that, at least not that I know of. Uh, although he is a little mysterious, so maybe he is hiding something. But uh, he was telling me that in the, you know, 70s, when you went to the nightclubs, you didn't smell polo green. You know, you in in the even in the early 80s, you didn't smell very much Coros. You smelled Halston. This is what people wore you know, when they were partying in the 70s. And um, it's a shame that these are discontinued. Um, I think he ended up dying in the 90s as a result of an immune disease. But um, what a legacy he ended up leaving. And I'm so glad to have both of these. This is um, Halston Z14. And this is Halston 112 which is the underappreciated of the two. I, I prefer Z14, but of course, 112 is also fantastic. It's this floral fougere, almost like this um, very green. Uh, there is a lot of, um, you know, basil and juniper and pine, but then the base is labdanum and vanilla. It, it's got a heavy base to it, which I like. There's also a long lost... An underappreciated Halston, which I love, which no one talks about, uh, and it's called Catalyst for Men. And uh, this is Catalyst Halston Fragrances, Inc. And I don't know if you can see that, but uh, Catalyst came in this beaker, you know, chemistry beaker bottle, which is fantastic. Back when they used to make great bottles instead of just standard bottles, you know. I, not that I have a problem with this particular bottle, but it's standard. All the private blends go in it, that kind of thing. You know, this is a unique bottle for a unique fragrance. It's spicy, it's woody. Harry Fremont and uh, Elias Ermendis created this. And the note listing is insane. I mean, it's a, it's a Roja Dove note list. It's this long. Everything from vodka, tarragon, galbanum, bergamot, basil, geranium, Chamomile, bay leaf, rose, blackcurrant, nutmeg, violet, cinnamon, narcissus, tuberose, sage, orange, uh, lavender, amber, benzoin, oak moss, and castorium, patchouli, musk, leather, labdanum, sandalwood, tonka, vetiver, frankincense, cedarwood. This is a niche fragrance through and through in a designer bottle and um, heavily underappreciated, let's say. I think if more people got to smell this, their eyes would open to what we truly lost in the designer game. So that's the last Halston fragrance. And then we're going to do a couple one-offs. The first one-off is Tiffany for men. Tiffany got fame in the 1800s. Um, and they basically sold uh, stationary goods and fancy goods in their store in 1837 and then they they expanded to silver jewelry and pocket watches and it led to this massive increase of, of sales in, in jewelry for them and so 1848 was the most notable years for Tiffany because they um, the label introduced Swiss watches and diamonds and jewelry into its collection uh, and they were known as um, kind of high, high jewelry, uh, brand ever since. Uh, they've got that blue gift box, which now I think LVMH owns Tiffany. This is a vintage bottle of Tiffany for men, by the way. Looks like a belt buckle. How cool is that? You know, why can't they make fragrances like this anymore? Like, or bottles like this anymore? Why, why can't they have a little, you know, creative spark? Why does everything have to be boring today? Um, and so fine jewelries, watches, and then they ended up getting into fragrances. So Tiffany for Men, um, came out in 89. It says it's being marketed by Coty, but this is a vintage. I don't, I don't think this is still available to be honest with you. Uh, if it is, that's news to me. I think this is discontinued and, uh, this is the col spray cologne. So you know this is an older bottle. Uh, Jacques Polge and um, I think Francois Demachy made this together. Um, and fantastic fragrance. If you like 
This is like a in like a step up from Chanel Pour Monsieur, but if you like fragrances like this or you know Francois de Marchi in Jack's Poles also made all of the Ungaro fragrances, which I didn't even talk about my scent of the day. I will soon. Um, they made un all the Ungaro fragrances, so Ungaro two, for example. Uh, this is kind of this DNA, but with this giant civet note. Uh, sorry, we went to um, a water park the last couple days and I got water in my ear and it still won't really go away. Um, but this is this DNA, but with a massive civet note in the base. Um, and while we're talking about Ungaro, um, I told you I had a lot of fragrances to show you. While we're talking about Ungaro, I'll do my scent of the day real quick, which is, um, Ungaro Pour Lome 1, the first one from 91. And wow, what a fragrance this is. This is definitely, hands down, without a doubt, my favorite of the Ungaro line. I've got all three. Uh, I've got the third one here, the second one here, and the original one right here. This is the best of the bunch, hands down. There's the note tree on the back if you want to pause it and read that. But uh, it's in the same range. It's I love these er early 90, late 80s fragrances. It's in the same, um, uh, it's this spicy floral um, fragrance is basically what it is, but it will remind you of fragrances like YSL Jazz from the late 80s or Guerlain Heritage, which came out the very next year in 92. This is 91. And just the way that the lavender mixes with the Petit Gran, uh, it's that her herbal lavender, and then you get the the carnation, geranium, clary sage, rose. It's just fantastic. Loads of oak moss in the base, musk, amber, and tonka. I absolutely love this DNA. There's another fragrance which is in this DNA from the same time frame that we're coming that I will show you guys very soon. Okay, next we're gonna do another one hit wonder for my collection, and that's Perry Ellis for men. Um now. Make sure you get the cologne for men. I've said this many times on my channel, but I'll say it again for the newbies that didn't catch it the first 10 times I said it. Cologne for men is what you want. If you get the Eau de Toilette, you're getting a completely different fragrance. Uh, in fact, you're getting one of the worst reformulations I've ever smelled in my life. Perry Ellis for Men Cologne is a fantastic fragrance. There's loads of castorium, galbanum, clove, rose, leather, oak moss, vanilla. Um, you know, you, you have to pay tons of money nowadays to get a leathery, spicy, uh, you know, chiffre fragrance like this in today's market. And this is fantastic stuff. This is, you know, this is, this is a true under the radar gem. Perry Ellis, um, you know, his fragrances are kind of looked down on as cheap, but this one from 85 is a winner. And whether the bottle is big like this or shrunk, make sure it says cologne in your set. Uh, so that is the Perry Ellis. Now we're going to do a niche house from New York called Bond Number no. 9. And um, Bond Number no. 9 was created by a woman named Larisse Rom, who used to have, uh, who used to be a distributor for Creed, okay? And she left Creed for whatever reason. She gained a lot of knowledge being a distributor for Creed. And she opened up her own store at, surprise, surprise, Bond Number no. 9, or Number no. 9 Street in New York was, was their address. So it became the name of the brand. And, um, I'm a little hit or miss on the brand. You know, she uh, is very litigious. She will sue you if uh, you say anything bad about her brand from previous YouTube channels. Like, for example, Sebastian uh, from the Perfume Guy channel had an old channel called Man Loves Perfume. She actually made him close that down because he said some bad things about one of her fragrances. I don't like that kind of behavior. Um, that seems very petty to me extremely petty. 
And uh, I mean, if you can't take someone saying something bad about your fragrances, maybe you shouldn't be in fragrances. That's just my opinion. But um, the um, so she's been in the business for a long time, though. She was at Lancome in '73 as a sales assistant, and then she became artistic director at L'Oreal in, in USA in '76. So she's been in a lot of different places, right? And she gained a lot of experience. She worked as a Creed rep after that and then founded her own niche brand. And so the first one I'm going to show you is just basically called uh, Bond Number no. 9. I think the name of the fragrance is actually Bond Number no. 9 or Signature. It might, be, it might show up as Signature or Bond Number no. 9, but it came out in 2009. And uh, it's a Parfum concentration. It's the only one that's a Parfum. This is the big three point, what is this, 100 mils? Yeah, it's 100 mil. Uh, and this is Rose Oud with Tonka in this really um, unique musk. The musk in here is extremely unique. Haven't smelled many musks like this before. I think it's synthetic. I don't think there's any real deer musk, but I could be wrong. If the brand says it is, uh, then it is. If the brand says they're using real musk, they're using real musk. Please don't sue me. Uh, and so um, this is a completely unisex fragrance. It's a parfum. It's extremely strong, uh, but you might have a hard time sensing the oud in this. If you don't like skanky oud, I would still maybe say give this one a try. Um, I think this would smell amazing on a woman. It would smell amazing on a man. I, I wear this, of course, it's in my collection. But um, that is bond number nine signature or bond number nine, bond number nine. The next one is the Scent of Peace, which is their take on Aventus. Uh, came out in 2013. Aventus came out in 2010. This is pineapple, bergamot, juniper. The juniper is amped up here, right? So it's, it's almost like you took uh, Aventus and mixed it with royal water. Royal water has that heavy juniper berry note. Oh God, Ungaro Porlom one is just beautiful. It's 100% me. You know, it's it fits my person. I love these type of fragrances, and Ungaro Porlom one is oh, you know, look at the state of the bottle. I didn't care. I still bought it because it's so hard to find nowadays. Um, so back to centerpiece: pineapple, juniper, black currant, vetiver, cedarwood, musk, oak moss, and patchouli. It will remind you of Aventus. There's no getting around it. Um, but it's a fresher take on Aventus, if you will. There's no smokiness here, that kind of stuff. And then my favorite from the brand, and the only one I have a 50 mil bottle, I wish I had 100 mil of this and a 50 mil of the centerpiece, um, is this. This is New York Oud. And this is uh, discontinued, I think. It says it's still available for purchase, but I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, New York Oud is uh, this oud, saffron. But what makes me love this fragrance is they added a note of honey, okay? And they added a red plum note. And the red plum here is absolutely fantastic. It's spot on. Uh, and so you get this plum, this fruitiness with oud and orange zest and saffron, red rose, iris, patchouli, musk, honey, and vetiver. And the honey and the oud and the uh, rose, saffron, and plum, they just work beautifully together. Um, my favorite from the brand, hands down, no questions asked. All right, let's jump to the other side of the table. We're going to go to the great Estee Lauder, who, um, born in 1906, she uh, basically became enthusiastic about the work of her uncle who made ointments and medicinal products and stuff like that. And she started making samples. She distributed them door to door, canvassing hotels and parties. Then in 46, uh, the time had come for Estee Lauder to uh, start her own company. And uh, she expanded her label. She's produced more than 70 fragrances. The Estee Lauder portfolio is obviously very robust. They've got different collections. They've got the private collection and the modern collection and all that good stuff. They even have Aramis, which I'm, which I'm not even talking about. 
Um, not even bringing up Aramis, but, um, you know, Este, Este Louder has, I have a bunch of Aramis fragrances that I could have dragged out, but I didn't. Uh, she unfortunately died in 2004. She was an extremely generous lady, and um, one of her statements that I'll quote says, The most beautiful face in the world, it's yours. Or, perfume is like love. A little is never enough. And so, you have to take your hat off to Estee Lauder. She created some amazing fragrances. One of my favorites isn't even here. It's down under lock and key. But uh, the first one I'll show you is Youth Do. Youth Do is absolutely stunning. It was copied many times. Uh, Cinnabar takes um, pieces of Youth Do. JHL, which Estee Lauder made for Joseph Henry Lauder. JHL was also um, bits and pieces of Youth Do were taken, and then most famously YSL's Opium, which Estee Lauder was pissed, to say the least, that YSL, she says, stole her formula, um, borrowed her formula, whatever you want to call it. But uh, Josephine Catapano made this, and then she also had a hand in making JHL. So if you like Youth Do, I would urge you to try JHL, even though it's for men. If you're a woman and you like this DH DNA, JHL is amazing. They basically made a fragrance, called it for men with the same DNA as Youth Do slash Cinnabar slash Opium, which I still have to try. I haven't tried Cinnabar yet. Uh, it's on my list. It's on my to sniff list, hopefully one day. But I love Opium. I've got like four bottles of this stuff. Um, but this is one of the most famous spicy oriental fragrances for women. The oak moss in these bottles is unbelievable. Um, it just gives it this something extra, but then it's, you know, there's lavender, there's fruitiness from peach, uh, there's clove, it's spicy, there's cassia, jasmine, lily of the valley, orchid, carnation, ylang, and, and cinnamon. Cinnamon's gorgeous. Amber, but then it's all about the amber, benzoin, vanilla, tolu, peru balsam, frankincense, that oriental base. Oh, I love this stuff. I absolutely love it. Um, I even love it more than this. This is louder for men. This one, I'm a little, and eh, it's not my favorite. Maybe if I got a vintage bottle, it would be. I think this is a newer bottle. Um, either way, louder for men is also really good. It's spicy, it's woody. I like uh, Youth Do and Azure. Azure is my favorite essay louder. Uh, I didn't bring the bottle, it's downstairs, but if you look up Azure, get the vintage. Uh, I've shown it off on my channel many times. Uh, and so this is this um, cardamom, coriander, sage, patchouli, sandalwood, vetiver, amber, oak moss. This is very spicy, woody, masculine, um, very professional fragrance is what I'd say. And then, of course, they also did this little beauty for women called Knowing. How about that bottle? Fantastic stuff. Um, it's hard to tell some of the old Estee Lauder, you know, where they were made and all that stuff. But this is a floral chiffre with plum, um, all kind of florals, rose, mimosa, tuberose, jasmine, orange blossom, patchouli, amber, oak moss, sandalwood, and vetiver. Beautiful floral chiffre. I, I I have no problem wearing this. Um, you know, Plum was in things like Poison had Plum, came out three years earlier, and then, of course, Knowing used Plum. Uh, and then we go to Giorgio Beverly Hills, which um, really, really started to uh, catch fire with um, their women's fragrance, which... Um, ended up being banned in some restaurants. Some It was so strong that uh, some restaurants said, you can't come in wearing Giorgio for women. Uh, this is Giorgio for men from 84. This is a vintage bottle. The new juice is almost like green looking uh, or clear, clear green. Uh, this is an older bottle. And I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but... Um, this is also discontinued, which is shocking. Um, I absolutely love this fragrance. It um, the patchouli in this is on the patchouli and honey. Patchouli and honey is just a winning combo. And then you get pimento in the top. 
orris, rose, cedar, cinnamon, vanilla, musk. Oh, it's so good. If you like this, I would urge you to try things like, uh, you could try to find some, a decant of Moss Brex from Tom Ford, which is discontinued. You could also try to find a bottle of Pavarotti, uh, which looks like this. But get this one. This is fantastic. Um, best celebrity fragrance of all time. Look at the way the bottle looks. That's the one you want. Pavarotti is fantastic stuff. Um, but if you like that honey patchouli, this is also one to put on the list. Even the new bottle's good, but if you can find a vintage, get it. Um, fantastic. And then they also did a fragrance called Red for Men, which is supposed to remind some people of Patau Porom, Patou Porom. Um, uh, there's a slight resemblance, but this is also discontinued. I wish I had a, I do have a vintage bottle, but it's a little mini. Um, but my big bottle is a modern one by EA and, um, you know, you get a little bit of that Patu Porom feel, um, but Patu Porom is just superior. I mean, it, it just can't, this can't compete with Patu Porom. You know, it's like saying a Honda and a Rolls Royce, they're both cars. They will both get you there, but you know, you can't put a Honda in a Rolls Royce you, category. You just can't. That's what red versus Patu Porom is, but I will do a comparison. The vintage is much better. I'll do a comparison with the vintage version and this one one day. And then of course, we have to talk about John Barbados, who worked as a designer in many of the American houses. He worked for Ralph Lauren. He also worked for Calvin Klein. Ah, oh, I forgot my Calvin Klein bottle. I was gonna bring Calvin by Calvin Klein. Look that up from 81. Um, Calvin Klein is another American designer, which I forgot to grab the bottles of, which was going to be on this list. Um, and so John Barbados, he worked for a lot of different brands. He created the legendary Nautica jeans. Um, he created Calvin Klein's. He was famously known for creating Calvin Klein's boxer briefs, which he basically said, hey, we just took some, you know, night, some, um, some sleeping pants for men basically and cut them halfway and thought hey that would be cool and they they caught on this boxer brief thing um and then he created his own brand 2004 uh was the first um it was the first fragrance for his brand it was called john barbados john barbados was the name of it and uh this is probably one of my favorite from the line now revlon this brand went through bankruptcy. Okay, so John Barbados went through bankruptcy. Revlon purchased the assets out of bankruptcy. I've never smelled the new Revlon bottles, okay? So I don't know if they're good or bad, but my guess is they're probably not that good. Revlon, it doesn't have a good reputation. But uh, if you've ever smelled the new stuff, let me know. This is an EA bottle, which usually also doesn't have the best reputation, but they've done a good job keeping this one current. It's dates, tamarind leaf, uh, coriander, clary sage, amber, oud. There's oud in this, which is a little bit of a, you know, risk for 2004. Black leather and vanilla and um, spicy, woody. I really like this as a designer perfume. The one everyone else likes that I'm still not 100% sold on, I need to wear it more, is John Barbados Vintage, which came out in 2006. Rodrigo Flores Rue, of course. Uh, white Lavender, Juniper, Jasmine, Patchouli, Balsam Fur, Tobacco, Tonka, and Suede. Uh, there is just this, you know, there's, there's, there, it's a very unique fragrance, I'll tell you that. Um, spicy and leathery, you think it would be right up my alley, but there's something in here that, you know, puts me off a little bit. I need to wear it more. But my favorite of the bunch is this. This is Dark Rebel Rider. So Dark Rebel, which I also have a decant of, but I didn't bring it. Um, this is a um, flanker of Dark Rebel. And um, another Rodrigo Flores Rue. I love leather fragrances. I love the bottle, by the way with the leather jacket, with the zipper that actually unzips. Well, it's supposed to unzip, mine's stuck. But I think it I think it does unzip, it's a real zipper. 
<clears throat> and um, this is a very complex fragrance. It opens with citron, which again is a heavily underused citrus, marjoram leaves, uh, Florentine iris, osmanthus absolute, labdanum, black violet, Somalian frankincense, and then a base of Russian leather, cacao, so you get that leather and chocolate. It's fantastic. Um, this one, Revlon did not pick up and continue creating, so this is officially discontinued, sadly. The best of the bunch, um, to my nose anyways. And then we're going to talk about a house called Rogue Perfumery. So Rogue was founded by the, the brand owner and perfume maker. His name is Manny Cross, Manuel Cross. Oh, God. This is... Uh, so his whole story is he was a chef for 30 years and he became a fragrance enthusiast, kind of like me. He had a whole bunch of bottles. And um, he was very disgruntled with the way that the industry was um, going. He didn't like Ifra destroying the old fragrances. So he created this house called Rogue. And the house of Rogue was supposed to go against the grain. It was supposed to go against IFRA, and it was supposed to be non-IFRA compliant. Now, now it actually is IFRA compliant, but I think in the early days of Rogue, the whole point of the house was that it is supposed to be a rogue house that isn't following the rules, isn't following the trends, isn't following IFRA's guidelines, that kind of stuff. That really appealed to me. Um, you know, that outlaw mentality. I love that. And um, very American, by the way. And... Um, this is a floral chiffre, a fantastic note of kiffer lime in the opening. And look at the green from the oak moss, the real oak moss, absolute. The newer bottles aren't as green as these older ones from what I've seen. Um, I wonder if some of the oak moss has been toned down. It had to have been. But there's also um, civet, so it's a little bit animalic, but, and it's a little bit floral because of the jasmine absolute and ylang ylang. But that kiffer lime opening is just stunning. It's fantastic. Um, this is for the true connoisseurs, I would say. If you're a chiffre lover, I'd highly check that out. Now, one that I struggle with, I'm glad I have it, but it's not my favorite. It's probably my least favorite, actually, from the brand. It's called Dervish. And if you know me and you know this fragrance, you know immediately why I struggle with this one. It's so sweet disgustingly sweet. Now the sweetness starts out at like an 11 out of 10. And then as the fragrance dies, it goes less and less and less. By hour two or three, I like it. But I have to suffer through two or three hours uh, of, you know, heavy, sweet, saffron, vanilla, sweet, you know, ultra sweet, synthetic. And um, the base is civet, leather, sandalwood, frankincense, labdanum, stuff I love. And but to get there, you got to you got to struggle a little bit if you're like me. If you like sweet fragrances, this might be a a gem for you, dervish. But um it's an oriental spicy super sweet fragrance. And then one of his most popular fragrances is this. This is called Mousse Illumine. And Mousse Illumine is a green, spicy, oak moss bomb. Uh, there's tons of oak moss. There's tons of um, frankincense, lemony, piney frankincense with a huge dose of oak moss. And um, this white musk, almost like you've got this, um, almost like you've got this foamy shaving cream-like vibe. Um, with Artemisia and Cypress, which is a heavily underused note in men's perfumery. White blossoms, tree moss, and cedar. It's very unique. It's very clean, fresh. I love wearing this in the heat. Um, you know, he's got some others which will wear better in the cooler weather. Dervish was one of them. And uh, this is also an all year round. This is one of the best fougeres I've ever smelled, ever. Okay, I've got Gucci Nobile. I've got all kind of fougeres. I've got all. I've got some of the best fougeres you can, you know, you can own. And this competes head to head with them. Spot on. This is Bon Monsieur. Bon Monsieur. I'm surprised no one talks about this more. This is, this is one of the best fougeres. There's just no other way to put it. It's a green fougere with amazing lavender absolute. 
amazing carnation, old school 80s fougere, you know? Um, oh, it's so good. Patchouli, cedar, sandalwood, lily of the valley, oak moss, geranium, fantastic lavender note, sharp, bracing, fresh. You know, if you miss the old 80s fougeres, you have to check out Bon Monsieur. It is fantastic. And then his tobacco scent, which also has some greenness to it, but I absolutely love. It's Tabac Vert. And Tabac Vert is, oh, it supposed to smell somewhat similar to Creed's um, original vintage Tabarone, which came out one year in 2009 or 10. They re-released it. Now flacons of that stuff are going for like 10 grand. But this is tobacco, sandalwood, pepper, musk, ketone, oak moss, bergamot, amber, and cedar. And there is this green feel to the tobacco. You know, it feels like it's a fresh green tobacco, but there's some dark heaviness to it. It's like you're smelling the freshness and you're smelling the, you know, tobacco, um, like a well-cured tobacco leaf combined at the same time. Very hard to do. And he did an amazing job. This is one of my favorite tobacco fragrances. You can see I'm a big fan of the house. Um, and then we're going to go to the house of Ralph Lauren, America through and through, right? We've got Polo Green in... 1978, uh, Ralph Lipschitz was the founder, and um, Polo Green is one of my favorite vintage fragrances. I have a backup bottle of it. Um, everything about the fragrance just screams masculinity to me. Leather and tobacco and all these fantastic notes that you associate with, um, with masculine fragrances from the 70s and 80s. In 91, they released this Polo Crest, which is discontinued now, unfortunately. Um, but it also has this leather, amped up caraway, amped up cumin, almost in the opening, but it's very green. There's tarragon, rosemary, juniper, pine. Um, I prefer the original, but Polo Crest is still a very good fragrance. They also released Chaps, which was supposed to be Almost like the cheaper alternative to Polo Green. Polo Green was expensive. It was for people with money. Chaps was for the everyday man. Oh, God. This is a Cosmere bottle, by the way. And I am a huge fan of Chaps. Uh, spicy, leathery, um, just amazing. Hev it's a Schieffer fragrance uh, that is heavily underappreciated, I would say. Heavily underappreciated. Uh, there's a little bit of powderiness to it as well. I'm not sure where that's coming from, but I love it. I think it is amazing. And, um, you know, now you have to pay hundreds for an old bottle of chaps. I was able to score three of them at the same time, which I'm glad I did because seeing the prices on some of those bottles is nuts. And then the fragrance I alluded to earlier that is in that same, you know, same sandbox as Ungaro Porlome 1 and Guerlain's Heritage and YSL Jazz is this. This is Ralph Lauren's Safari for Men in the beautiful whiskey decanter bottle. Uh, it is still available by L'Oreal. They butchered it though. If you can find a Cosmere bottle, I would highly encourage you to do so. Get a Cosmere version. Um, I just love this DNA. The lavender, that herbal lavender with aldehydes and tarragon and this green, um, this green feel to the opening, this vermouth-like feel. And then leather in the base, oak moss, cinnamon, patchouli, sandalwood. It's almost like this, uh, I don't know, modern, fug like an oriental fougere mix in some ways. It's fantastic. I love, the, I love what they were doing in the early 90s with fragrances. And then the one on the thumbnail, because of the American flag, is Polo Sport. And this is probably one of my favorite aquatic fragrances of all time. This is a smell of high school for me. You know, all my buddies in high school wore this. I didn't, but, you know, I can remember this smell throughout the locker room. Like, you couldn't imagine. Fresh, aquatic, aldehydes, lavender, narrowly, mint, 
cyclamen, geranium, ginger. There's even the seagrass note in here, which makes it very unique. Again, if you can get a Cosmere bottle, I would highly recommend it. The new stuff has lost a step. Um, you can tell the Cosmere bottles because the atomizer is silver. The new atomizers are plastic blue. But um, one of my favorite aquatics. <clears throat> and then there is a bottle that is very precious and dear to me. And probably the most American of all the American brands by Shulton, Old Spice. Now, this is Old Spice Leather Cologne. And the reason that this is dear to me is because this is a bottle that my grandfather owned. Uh, and he is, of course, no longer with us, but he owned this bottle and it was passed down to me. My father passed it down to me. And uh, the leather, the patchouli, the spices, there's no note tree listing, but it smells like there's some sort of um, maybe burp, maybe um, clove, cinnamon, that kind of vibe, but with the leathery base, you know, fantastic fragrance. Um, leather, Old Spice, leather cologne, the original Old Spice they used to put in the little starter packs that they gave to, um, to people who fought in World War II. You would get like a Gillette razor, you would get uh, Old Spice cologne, you'd get Lucky Strikes cigarettes that in your starter pack. I mean, what's more American than that? And then I picked a couple fragrances that I thought I would just talk about, you know, that remind me of revolution or starting anew or has something to do with you know, the American ideals, if you will, of capitalism and stuff like that. And the first one that I want to talk about is Jiki by Guerlain. And the reason I want to talk about Jiki, spicy floral fougere. What, uh, one of the Guerlains, I think it was Jean-Paul, said this is the only true fougere. Uh, this and fougere royale were the only two true fougeres ever made. And um, Jiki is on this list because when I think of revolution and starting anew, you know, Jiki was the first modern perfume to use synthetic ingredients to create a fragrance like this. And it really was a revolution in the fragrance world. It took you from, you know, one point in time, this is a line in the sand, just like the American Revolution was a line in the sand. This is a line in the sand for us uh, in the perfume world because there was everything before Jiki, you know, there was Hungry Water um, and, you know, Eau de Cologne. Um, there were, you know, fresh Eau de Colognes. What's that brand I'm thinking of? Uh, I can't think of the name now all of a sudden. Um, but there was a Splash On Cologne brand that was very popular, uh, I think, in Germany. I think it was founded in Cologne is why it's called Cologne. But... Um, It'll come to me, of course, as soon as I turn the video off. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I didn't bring my water, so my voice is going dry. But, um, you know, there was everything before Jiki, and then Jiki set off a revolution, and there was everything after. You know, there were changes. There were... Um, there, it, was, it sparked a new way of thinking in the Cologne world, and all of a sudden, this was kind of the using synthetics... Um, creating a fragrance in this manner, which was revolutionary at the time, became commonplace. And people started to see more and more of these creations. This is 1889 we're talking about. Um, and then I've got one Patu and one more Guerlain. The Patu is called Joy. And the reason Joy is on the list is because there's an amazing story. This was launched in 1935. I don't know if you guys know what was going on in 1935, but there was something called the Great Depression going on. And Joy is a floral animalic fragrance that's lavish and lush, and it is uh, expensive. High class material, the, the highest class ingredients. Uh, and this is what the original bottle looked like, by the way. This is what the original Joy bottle looked like right here.
and um, oh, animalic floral. If you like fragrances like um, if you like fragrances like Emwaj Gold, I would highly encourage you to try Joy. And the reason it's on this list is it came out in 1935, Great Depression. Everyone lost their money, and you know, as far as a uh, business goes, as far as capitalism goes, to have the gall to launch something like this in the heart of the Great Depression, walk up to people's front doors with a bottle of joy on a, you know, a uh, pillow and, you know, hopefully bring them a little bit of joy, uh, in a very dark time. I mean, that is, uh, to me anyways, that really represents... American capitalism at its at, in its darkest hour still kind of shining through and then the final one is Mitsuko and this one maybe you guys won't understand why it's on the list but I wore this to bed last night the eau de toilette and it instantly is my favorite version of Mitsuko I like it better than the eau de parfum which I tend to do with Guerlain's I feel like the eau de toilettes are better than the eau de parfums and um, Joy I'm sorry uh, Mitsuko is a story about a, a woman who is married and falls in love with a um, captain or a naval officer in the Japanese Navy. And so this one to me is a little bit of a revolution of the heart. Um, and while, you know, obviously the story is... Um, a little risque for the time. She obviously had an affair on her husband. Um, it it just brought to mind almost like a it brought to mind like a revolution of the heart, revolution of the of of the of the soul of the heart of you know your inner self, who you love, that kind of stuff, and plus. The fragrance itself completely blew me away yesterday, and I wanted a reason to talk about it. So this is a little bit of a... Uh, you've got to maybe stretch your thinking a little bit to see how this fits in with American Revolution, but I wanted to talk about it. It's on the list. Mitsuko EDT. What a fragrance. I I mean, I was, I was just... The first hour and a half, I was just dumbfounded by this fragrance. The peach um, is nothing like the peach in the Eau de Parfum. It is more vibrant. Uh, the bergamot in the opening is just unreal. That guerlainade, the rose, the iris, the clove, the jasmine, the vanilla. Oh, unbelievable. What a fragrance. So, I hope you've enjoyed this 4th of July special. Some of them you had to stretch your thinking on a little bit. Some of them, you can obviously see, they're American designers, American creators, or they immigrated here and started their business in America. So, happy 4th of July to everyone who's celebrating. Uh, I hope you guys have a safe, happy 4th of July. And uh, we're going to go watch some fireworks tonight. So, I appreciate everyone watching, subscribing, commenting. I appreciate the continued support. And I hope to be back tomorrow with another video. Bye, guys.